Kathleen Marden. Thank you again so much for doing this. I deeply appreciate you. And sorry you couldn't come in. It would have been nice to have you sitting here across the table from me, but I know you said you were fighting. You had a battle with COVID. Yes, I did, and uh, I'm getting over it. I'm nearly over it, but I'm just taking it easy at this point. That's good. How are you feeling otherwise? Pretty good from it? I mean, was it, did it really knock the wind out of you or was it? It did. did. I was sick for 15 months. Wow. I had long COVID. Oh, well, I'm glad you're feeling a lot better and everything. So for people that don't know, you are a former um, MUFON and you were the, I have it written down here. I have a bunch of papers in front of me. So I'm like kind of all over the place, but a uh, former director of field investigator training and mm -hmm. the founder of MUFON experience resource team. That's correct. And I'm still on the team. I'm on the executive committee and oh, okay. I'm also a consultant to the team. Uh, I founded the team and was director for 10 years. Now, for people that don't know, you are, I, I guess, in some sense, uh, in a weird way, connected big time to the UFO, uh, I guess, uh, community with your aunt and uncle, Betty and Barney Hill. Yes, absolutely. Um, I was 13 years old when they had their experience. My mother was Betty's sister. And the first person that Betty called when they arrived home. And so this whole situation started in September of 61. Am I correct? That's correct. So you've been around this a long time and been doing this a while. Now your aunt and uncle, they were, they were coming home from, I, if, if I'm correct, from a trip from up north. Yes, they took a spur of the moment trip to Niagara Falls. There's a story behind that. Uh, I had been there a couple of months earlier with a different aunt and uncle, and we were a close family. Betty and Barney were at my childhood home probably at least once every weekend. And I had photographs and displayed them in front of Betty and Barney. And I was so excited about my trip and explaining what I'd done. And Barney turned to Betty and said, do you think that you might like go to go to Niagara Falls? And she said that she would. It would make a nice vacation. So he decided to surprise her with this trip when she had a week's vacation. She was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. She worked in child welfare and adoption. And uh, so there it was uh, in se mid-September 1961, Betty and Barney were off on a long vacation trip to Niagara Falls and through Ontario and then on to Montreal and then back home. Only they had an interruption along the way, one anti unanticipated interruption, and it changed the course of their lives. And that that was the the long drive home. So now I've read a few things and seen a few things on television and whatnot. So your aunt and uncle noticed something in the sky and you're, they they believed it may have been a satellite? Uh, my aunt saw it first. My uncle was driving the car. So they were just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire, and upstate New Hampshire. When she saw what appeared to be uh, like a falling star, only instead of moving in an arc downward like a falling star does, this moved upward in an arc. And so this was very perplexing to her. She tried to explain it. And Barney tried to, of course, didn't see it and thought, well, maybe you're seeing a satellite. Maybe uh, it's any of a number of conventional flying objects. But it wasn't. It grew larger and larger in the sky. 
as Betty continued to watch it. And finally, a few more miles south of Lancaster, she asked Barney to stop again because this was coming in quite close at this point. And uh, so they got out of the car. They, they looked at it actually a couple of times before uh, finally they were in Lincoln, New Hampshire, and this craft swooped down and hovered about 200 feet off the ground next to their vehicle. In fact, Barney had to stop the car in the middle of the road and he opened the door. So normally the, the inside, the interior light was on um, and also uh, the car motor was running. So he stepped out with his binoculars and he looked up at this craft and he described what he saw as a giant pancake hanging silently in the air. And he could see uh, along the forward edge of this craft brilliantly lit windows, a, sort of a blue-white. He, he described it uh, as being similar to the intensity of a mercury light. And he stepped away from where he was standing, uh, touching the car, uh, and the craft moved to an adjacent field. It now descended to within 100 feet of the ground. And Barney put his binoculars up to his eyes and looked at this. He had to, of course, walk over to where it was. And what he saw was figures who that were looking back at him. They were dressed in black, shiny uniforms. There were several of them. And suddenly, all but one turned to what appeared to be some kind of a panel, uh, and their arms went up. He could see them from you know, the tops of their arms down to their knees at this point. And when they did that, little red lights on fin-like structures started to slide out from this silent hovering craft that was very, very large at this point. And when that happened, something started to drop down out of the bottom of the craft. Barney looked at the one that was staring down at him, still at the window, and the expression on his face caused Barney to believe that he had a plan. And that plan was to capture Barney. He pulled the binoculars away from his eyes so forcefully that he broke the leather strap and ran screaming back to the car, telling Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. As he was getting into the car, he saw that the craft was following him back in his direction. He went speeding down the highway. So the the um, he returned. Okay, he returned to the car, screaming to Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. Within moments, a series of code-like buzzing sounds could be heard on the trunk of their vehicle. It caused the car to vibrate, and a and a, an electrical tingling sensation to pass through their bodies. They could actually feel this. And Betty felt of the metal on the car to see if she'd receive an electric shock. She didn't. When they arrived home, they discovered a series of shiny spots on the trunk of the car in precisely the location where they heard these buzzing sounds. They then uh, sort of, uh, their memories became very, very hazy. They found themselves 35 miles down the highway. They had hazy memories of having been on a dirt road with tall trees all around. Hazy memories of a roadblock and of a fiery orb that appeared to be sitting on the ground. They didn't know what that was but they drove on home. They wanted human contact. They were looking for a police officer, maybe a coffee shop that was open. They thought they would arrive home between two or three in the morning 
And when they finally reached their home on, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on the seacoast, it was 516 by Betty's watch. So they lost two hours of time completely from the time right. that they got home. So was there any other description of the craft in general from Barney and Betty? Was this the size of this craft? How big with the windows was this thing? If they saw, you know, a good size of it. I have a measurement and that was uh, the old man of the mountain that fell off the mountain in 2003, but was there in 1961. He was 48 feet from forehead to chin line. And Betty said that that craft was at least one and a half, maybe two times the length of that old man's profile. Now, so they get, they get home and I, I'm sure their minds are going just absolutely crazy wondering you know what the heck just happened and everything uh what type of who did they reach out to right away did they speak to anybody right away did they just play it off like maybe i'm just hallucinating am i dreaming or did this really happen betty reached out to my mother right away betty owned uh an apartment building and uh, she spoke to her upstairs neighbors. The man was in the Air Force, stationed at Pease Air Force Base. Um, okay. That evening, my father's best friend, who was a police officer, stopped by for his nightly cup of coffee. And <laughs> he advised my mother to tell Betty to make a report to Pease Air Force Base in Newington. So she and Barney did make that report. The following day, the Air Force officer called them back uh, to clarify points on that report. So they had was that, that to report. was that report to the Captain Paul uh, Henderson? Yes, it was. Okay, and when when they made that report to Captain Henderson, did he reach out and to you know? somebody who else was into researching these so-called UFOs, UAPs? Paul Henderson uh, represented you know, the Air Force, but the report went to Project Blue Book. Gotcha. And how did Project Blue Book look into this situation? Uh, I can tell you that... Project Blue Book didn't really look into the situation. Uh, they were in a dismissive mode at that time. Swamp but, gas? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe an advertising light. An advertising light. Can you imagine that in a, a rural area of New Hampshire? Actually, a desolate area, Franconia Notch, uh, with mountains all around. And uh, supposedly the searchlight was advertising a movie at uh, some oh. movie theater, which is really ridiculous. There were two radar reports that night. Uh, I have the copies of, of those two reports. Uh, other Air Force officers looked into this uh, and actually criticized the Air Force's initial handling of this and their cover up. I can tell you that when this ended up going public in 1965, the Hills file was sent to the Pentagon. So there definitely was Air Force interest. Now, the Air Force did not refer Betty and Barney to the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. But Betty went to the Portsmouth Public Library. She didn't know anything about UFOs. So she decided to check out the first book she had ever read on the topic. And uh, in it, there was an address for NICAP. And uh, they asked if you saw a UFO to report it. 
So she and Barney sat down. She was the typist. She wrote the letter and they re made the report to NICAP. And she even mentioned those figures dressed in black shiny uniforms and how Barney was so frightened by them. She talked about the erratic flight pattern, uh, et cetera. And that brought Walter Webb uh, from NICAP to Betty's and Barney's home. He was a scientist. He was an astronomer at the Hayden Planetarium. And he had been a volunteer with Dr. Alan Hynek, who was an astrophysicist. He was at Harvard at that time and was working on the satellite program. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hynek was also the astronomical consultant for Project Blue Book for many, many years. Yes. Now, were there other other major witnesses to that night besides the gentleman on the mountain? Were there anybody else, anybody else seen or heard anything in the area that your aunt and uncle were in prior to this? Any other reports to the Air Force or to any local police, sheriffs, or anything like that? What I can tell you about that is that in 1965, John, 64, 65, I think it was 65, John Luttrell, who was a journalist, an award-winning journalist for the Boston Traveler, uh, got wind of this story. There was a violation of confidentiality. And he did a very thorough investigation of this case. And he found six witnesses at that point. And he wrote about the witnesses. He wrote about the Hill story, um, did not consider them to be a couple of nuts. He, he wrote the uh, very accurate information about them and also about the Air Force cover-up. And uh, I was angry with him for I, a, a lot of years, I have to tell you, but <laughs> that is because he changed my family's lives and because his work caused so much distress for Betty and Barney and for the rest of the family. You know, that's probably oh, the reason sure. why I do what I do today. But uh, so he had found six witnesses when he wrote the article. But I have a letter from him where he stated that he had found 12 to 14 witnesses who were in uh, the same location on the same night at the same time. They weren't in a group together. They were either individuals or couples outside, and they saw the same thing in the same location that Betty and Barney did. So that's, yes, that's, there were- That's a lot witnesses. of witnesses. I've had other people since then during my own investigation uh, who told me that they had witnessed something that night. Now, let me let me back up just a little bit here. You're 13 years old when you, you're at home with your mother. And what is happening? What do you see in your mind? And you see this phone call come into the home and the reaction from your mother to all this. What what do you see? What do you feel like? What is going on in in your mind? Well, I was sitting at the dining room table. My mother was ironing clothing. So the ironing board was set up. The iron was there. The telephone um, was on the wall and the cord was long enough so that she could iron. Oh, I remember those. Cigarettes and talk to <laughs> Betty. So what I heard is concern in my mother's voice. Mm. Uh, Betty was concerned about the possibility of contamination because that craft had been so close to them. We had a neighbor who was a physicist and my mother told Betty that she would call our neighbor when he arrived home from work and get back to her about what they should do. After my hung mother hung up the phone, she told me that 
my aunt and uncle had uh, seen a flying saucer up close the previous evening, and I was shocked. I said, what do you mean a flying saucer? And she said, uh, ex aliens from another planet or something like that. And I said, well, as far as I know, there's no life on other planets. How could that be possible? <laughs> but I knew, <laughs> I knew that my aunt and uncle wouldn't make up something like that. They were highly reputable people. When they found out that all this came out and about, how how hard did it hit them? Like, were they being bombarded with people? Because I know they were big into the civil rights and and things like that. So were they worried like something like this might jeopardize their credibility for different things? They were definitely worried about their credibility. They were afraid that they might be fired from their jobs. I mean, there were many, many concerns. They were highly credible people. And, you know, suddenly the those who uh, wanted to discredit them were painting them with a new brush as, as a, you know, a couple of nuts. People who didn't know them, but who wanted to discredit them were painting them with a different brush. They gotcha. uh, were casting them as a couple of kooks uh, who believed they had this experience. They changed the story on Betty and Barney and made it seem that they had only seen a distant light in the sky and that then Betty had some dreams and Barney believed her, her dreams. I mean, so it, it, their story, I'm talking about the disinformants or the skeptics, whatever you want to call them, uh, was right. very different than the original documented evidence on what occurred. After everything's going on and time is of the essence and things are moving along, your aunt starts having... Uh, these nightmares, these terrors at night and starts feeling overwhelmed with all this. So how do they proceed to look into that, to deal with those emotions of what they went through? Well, Betty, remember, did not see the ETs. She, had, she did not have conscious memory of observing these non-humans. It was Barney who did. The impact was greater on Barney. Betty had a series of five dreams. Uh, they happened uh, very early in the morning, just before she woke up. You could call them uh, hypnotic dreams. Hypnotic dreams may contain real information, memories, but they would be mixed with some fantasy material uh, to overcome any anxiety that you might be feeling about an experience. For Barney, it was different. He okay. ended up with bleeding ulcers, um, he, a great deal of anxiety about what he saw. Uh, he ended up in the hospital with these bleeding ulcers, this life-threatening condition. He had to take a leave of absence from his job at the post office. And uh, then he was referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon in Boston, Massachusetts, he was a neuropsychiatrist who had worked highly successfully with veterans returning from the war who were suffering from shell shock. And, you know, in a sense, Barney yes. had uh, what we now think of as post-traumatic stress. PTSD, so he was the yes. Person to work with Barney. Uh, with, and uh, Betty went along with him and asked if he would work with her too. Uh, because he used deep trance hypnosis. And he agreed to as long as he saw them separately and he reinstated amnesia at the end of each session. So they could not compare stories, could not compare information or contaminate what one another said. That's, that is, that is wild. So, there's how how lined up were their stories since they weren't able to communicate with one another on what they each happened to bring out how close in 
idea to idea, the story to story, were your aunt and uncle to the doctor? Stories that each one told under hypnosis were nearly identical, but told from their own perspective. They would take them to separate rooms. So they told about what happened in the own, their own room that they were in. They mm. described the entities who were in there and their own uh, physical examinations. How many, how many months, years did, did your aunt and uncle go through this hypnotherapy? Uh, it lasted for six months. That included the hypnosis and then uh, talk therapy with Dr. Simon permitted them to listen to all of the hypnosis tapes. And you know, they worked it, through that together. It's funny. I was watching uh, another podcast and the gentleman was interviewing Travis Walton. And yes. Travis Walton was, you know, he was another big abductee. And he was uh, talking about everything that he went through and then the possibility of doing hypnosis and stuff. And I believe he stated uh, that your aunt reached out to him and actually said something to him in the, the way of, you know, uh, Betty told him, don't let them make you into uh, a parody of yourself when he thought about that hypnosis. Absolutely. Uh, he was hypnotized by uh, Dr. James Harder and that is the risk you take when mm. you reveal this kind of information and it goes public. And Travis didn't even reveal it. He was wanted. He was missing for yeah. five days. And uh, unfortunately, the disinformation program that uh, was CIA funded, uh, conceived of in uh, January of 1953, uh, was being carried out with vigor, and anyone who reported this kind of thing uh, was uh, discredited. Everything within uh, the power of these disinformants was used to discredit these individuals and change their story so that the public would not believe what they told them, regardless of the amount of evidence, you were to believe that there was no evidence whatsoever. Now, speaking of evidence, there is a bunch of evidence with your aunt and uncle, am I correct? You are absolutely correct. Uh, there were shiny spots on the trunk of their vehicle, uh, about the size of half dollars that hadn't been there the night before or the day before. And when Betty placed a compass over them, the needle whirled. But when she moved it to another area of the car, the needle dropped down. So there was this magnetic field in this particular area. Barney did the same thing. It behaved the same way for him. I saw those spots. Uh, Betty's dress was torn in several places when she arrived home. Uh, and it's undergone scientific analysis numerous times with anomalous findings. Uh, Barney's best dress shoes were so deeply scraped that he had to purchase new shoes. The legs of his pants were covered with vegetative matter. The watches they were wearing never ran again. Uh, of course, the binocular strap was broken uh, and they both had the emotional impact of what occurred. Were there any type of physical scars on the body in general from anything whatsoever? Um, when Barney arrived home, he checked himself in the bathroom uh, because he felt that something had happened to his groin. And later on, during his uh, hypnosis sessions where he lived, relived that examination where they placed a cup over his groin. Uh, he developed warts uh, in that particular area in the round circle in the area where that cup had been placed. I just, I could not imagine what 
your aunt and uncle went through just the the mind would would drive me crazy trying to figure out everything that they went through now yourself you're 13 you learn all this as time goes on you decide to get involved a little bit heavier so give me a little bit of your stepage into betty and barney's situation and how you worked your way into helping better the evidence and the discussions and everything that has come out and about over the years well let me first say that i had a career. I went to college, I was uh, a social worker, then I went into the field of education, worked as a teacher and an education services coordinator. And finally, uh, back in the mid 1980s, I started working uh, with Betty. I wanted to know everything that she knew about the UFO field. Then in 1991, I joined the Mutual UFO Network and very quickly, became a trained field investigator, certified, and began my own investigations. One of those investigations was the investigation of my aunt and uncle's case. So uh, hmm. this was a formal multi-year investigation of uh, the archival records of uh, the, an actual on-site investigation over and over again. My husband and I drove the entire route that Betty and Barney drove in the same time frame, uh, time of the year. And uh, we I was actually looking for any way to discredit this, to explain it away <sighs> as maybe a mistake, but I couldn't. In the end, mm. And I believe that I've done the most thorough investigation that anyone has ever done on this. And I'm the trustee of Betty's estates and her, uh, her archival collection. So I have all of her records. I interviewed her over and over and over again. We were very close when I moved back to New Hampshire. And um, so... I think I, I have it all. I've read everything that the uh, skeptics, debunkers, whatever you want to call them, have written about the case. I know the holes in their arguments. And uh, when I wrote the book Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, I asked Stanton Friedman, who is a nuclear physicist and a very famous uh, UFO investigator, UFO, scientific ufologist, uh, if he was interested in contributing to the book, he contributed a couple of chapters. He had uh, been responsible for finding scientists to vet uh, Marjorie Fish's work on a star map that Betty had observed inside the craft and had sketched. Uh, and uh, he also specialized in debating with debunkers and skeptics. And so <laughs> he wrote a chapter on the disinformation as well. So I was uh, very grateful to him for contributing to my work. That's fantastic. Now, the, the star map, is that that's something that you were able to look deeper into with some scientists and you know professors and find out maybe something it, is it a something close to us in the galaxy or anything like that uh yes the star map is uh, about 39 light years uh i shouldn't say the star map the sun is on mm. the star map uh, the zeta reticuli uh, star system is about 39 light years away. And it's hmm. a binary star system. We do not have the technology to determine to even today if there is life on that planet. But it uh, is an area in an area of our galaxy that has exoplanets, uh, that hmm. an abundance of exoplanets. So uh, very intriguing. There was an update on the star map. 
in 2013, and it was still at that time the best match when I think it was a couple of thousand models, uh, computer models were used to attempt to find this place in our local galactic neighborhood. Uh, Marjorie Fish, who was the amateur astronomer who uh, did the first work, was a brilliant woman. And the astronomers who analyzed her work, who vetted her work after, said that uh, it was the closest that they could find, and it had special characteristics. All of the stars on Betty's map were sun-like, although only 5% of the stars in our local galactic neighborhood out 54 light years are sun-like. So uh, that was, mm -hmm. uh, I think, more than a coincidence. In fact, one of the astronomers stated that if we lived on Zeta Reticuli and we had developed the technology to travel through space, the route that they took, because they drew lines to different star systems they were going to, the route that they took would be logical and would be the same route that we would take. Let me let me let me jump off subject here and go to something with you. What is your take on getting out there? How do you feel? Do you think there's some type of portals, some type of other? I don't know, like a, a black hole thingy, majiggy, or, or <laughs> some type of um. You know, there, there's, there's so many aspects out there. You know, from sci-fi movies and whatnot. You know, the whole warp drive type thing. What, do, what, what do you think on things like that? Like the, the whole dimension and possible. Are they able to bend time to get here or hold time to get back and forth? I, I prefer to listen to theoretical physicists rather than to watch <laughs> sci-fi movies. And yeah, the theoretical right. physicists have um, several hypotheses. Um, we do know at this point from what I've recently learned that as you go deeper into space, you move into different dimensions. So uh, the travel could be uh, interdimensional travel through portals or even through po the possibility of uh, black holes that you could travel through, or perhaps they do bend time and space. I don't have a particular theory on that. I leave that to the <laughs> physicists. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you on that. Now, let me, let me ask you something too. The, once your aunt and uncle uh, got out and about with everything and everything came out and the the recordings, I've, I've listened to some of those through some of the documentaries and stuff like that. Those are heart wrenching. I mean, that is truly some very scary thoughts that have come through and what they went through. Did was any of that, you know, did they almost repeat similar uh, issues when they went back into hypnosis over and over again? Would, would it be, be like what was on those tapes over and over? No, no. Um, in their separate hypnosis sessions, they each had what is called an ab reaction, which is a tremendous release of emotions uh, at the point that that fear was strongest. Uh, that for Barney, it was when he was standing in the field, looking up at this craft and having the feeling that he was going to be captured. Uh, he, he lost it. Um, in, I have all the hypnosis tapes. I've transcribed them. I've listened to them repeatedly almost memorize them. And uh, it, it's, it's very hard. I wept when I listened to Barney the first few times going through that powerful ab reaction. Uh, for Betty, it was when those entities were standing in the road and walking toward the vehicle. She attempted to 
uh, escape to open the car door, but they captured her and uh, she was crying. She uh, had never been so frightened in her entire life. She had a real struggle with that. I just can't imagine everything that your aunt and uncle went through on something like that. It's just, if the whole aspect of that and just, you know, trying to stay sane throughout all those years. But I mean, in, in some sense, they, what they went through did, I think, and in, in, in my eyes, initiated a lot of spark for a lot of good things to come more investigations, more people diving into things and people trying to, to look deeper into situations that did arise that people said that they were, I, I don't know, do they still use the word abducted now? Or how do they, is there a new ter term that they use these days? Well, it, abducted is no longer a popular term. People prefer okay. to call themselves experiencers. So, you know, you could say they gotcha. were taken to craft uh, rather than saying they were abducted because not everybody uh, goes unwillingly the way Ben and <laughs> is, is, Hence the, I guess, with uh, MUFON's, uh, you know, experience or resource team now. Is, is that what it originally was? It was originally... Uh, the uh, let's see abduction research team when I found it. Don't politically it correct. <laughs> <laughs> but um, through uh, political pressure from people who would have these experiences, we ended up deciding to change the name to uh, first from abduction to experiencer, and then from research to resource because the team is now more focused on uh, assisting people who have had these experiences to uh, work through their uh, emotions uh, related to what occurred um, to help them to know where to look for deeper understanding. So you've spent all these years now with MUFON and You've done all these investigations. What what stands out the most? Is there one particular investigation that you're just like, oh man, I just, it's always there. I, I'm so excited I got to do this. Is there one that stands out for you the most that you keep close besides your aunt and uncle? <laughs> Gosh, uh, you know, it's like saying which five of my, uh, which one of my five children do I prefer? <laughs> <laughs> I, right. Uh, I do have at least five extraordinarily interesting cases, some with a great deal of physical evidence, uh, lifelong mm. uh, contact uh, to uh, cases where there's one case where uh, the individual was healed from cancer by these oh. ETs. Uh, another case where the individual uh, had been a commercial pilot and uh, had no interest in UFOs, but sort of uh, stumbled on this. He was at his little airport and uh, people were out on his runway one night. He went out to find out what was going on and they were looking at a UFO uh, of the intensity that he told me he had never seen before. He decided that he was going to try to make contact and to uh, call in these entities and sit down and talk to them, find out what they were doing. That's not what happened. He was a puppet. Hmm. And hmm. then he was terrified and he did all the wrong things. Uh, he, he ended up having some really horrifying experiences. I wrote the book, um, Let's see, extraterrestrial contact, what to do when you've been abducted. And those yes. stories are in that book. Um, almost okay. all of uh, my five favorites are in that particular book. You can also find some of my favorites in the, uh, the alien abduction files that I wrote with Denise Stoner. And Denise okay. Stoner is a longtime multi-generational 
uh, abductee. And also my new book that is just being released this week is Forbidden Knowledge, a, per, a personal journey from alien abduction to spiritual transformation. And uh, I have an, an incredibly interesting uh, uh, investigation that I did on three people who were taken at the same time in North Carolina and actually captured video evidence of the non-humans coming in. So uh, yeah, I've had some really amazing um, cases mm. that I've investigated. But I have to tell you, I've probably spoken with, uh, might say investigated a couple of thousand cases um, on my own. And I have like maybe 10 that are really outstanding with terrific evidence. Ooh. And and the others just don't have evidence. Mm -hmm. They have a story and a very interesting story. Um, the emotional part, the emotional factor is uh, intriguing. I was, I did a podcast back in December with uh, Teresa Tyndall, the former MUFON director of Maryland. And mm -hmm. it, we we got into a little discussion on the the old religious paintings with the the UFOs in them. Do you know these paintings? The the baptism of Christ, the the Holy Mother, where it, it's like these little gold, almost UFOs. It looks like above their head, and the ray the rays are coming down. It's just one of those things that we got into. I, what is your 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 outlook on the the whole religion and possible spiritual beings of extraterrestrials? Well, we have a very long history of these dish-shaped craft, um, and including the one, ones hanging at the Vatican um, mm. Art Museum that you're speaking of. Uh, you can look online and you can find uh, historical paintings uh, of UFOs in uh, craft. You have also uh, the Marian apparitions, uh, such as happened uh, in Port Portugal, um, mm -hmm. and Medjugorje, uh, and, and in other places around the world, where uh, there's a question about whether or not those apparitions were actually the Virgin Mary or if they were actual UFOs um, because um, I believe it was the one in Portugal where uh, the, it started raining. It was raining very, very hard. There were thousands of people who had gone to that area when the three shepherd children were uh, out and the Virgin Mary was going to appear to uh, one of them again, who later became a nun. And she, uh, of course, saw the Virgin Mary, but what everybody else who was standing there saw was a very bright, bright object. In fact, you know, this was a long time ago. They thought it was mm -hmm. the sun falling toward the earth. And it actually dried their wet clothing. Uh, it had the, the description of a UFO, of unconventional craft that we think of. So, uh, you know, there's a good chance that some of this uh, was actually UFO related. And uh, it, it's part of our religion as well, because uh, experiencers one thing that they experience is a spiritual awakening after they right. move beyond fear and the ets mm. tell them that we are out of sync our technological development is out of sync with our spiritual growth and when this happens it could lead to annihilation so they uh the, this is something that's common 
among people who have had these experiences. Uh, maybe they're somehow related. Mm. Maybe these ETs are using this format to communicate with humans to advance their agenda. I don't know the answers. The most recent Marian apparition was to Chris Bledsoe. You may have heard of him. He's from North Carolina. I have. He just wrote the book, UFOs of God. I, and, I actually just uh, ordered that book. <laughs> <laughs> and so he uh, has, uh, he's, has a verified uh, UFO experience uh, investigated not only by MUFON, but by uh, John Alexander, Colonel John Alexander, retired PhD, and by a high-ranking officer in the CIA, they mm. all say this is real. Chris has had two experiences where this uh, female uh, form, kind of an angelic form without the wings, dressed in a long white robe, has appeared and given him prophecy. That is... I, I'm actually looking very forward to uh, reading his book. I placed an order, and it's on a six- to seven-week wait. <laughs> uh, it's a great book. But, uh, I love it, and uh, I endorse it. So this past summer, we had those testimonies in Washington with uh, David Grush, and we had Ryan Graves and Commander Fravor, you know, yeah. stepping up to the plate and, you know, trying to give some recognition like, hey, you know, there's stuff happening out here and we're seeing this, we're picking it up, you know, we need to do something about this. And, and apparently, you know, we're in possession of, you know, craft and non-biologicals. So what, what's your take on everything that has happened this past summer on the Hill with, you know, these testimonies? Well, I'm very pleased that Congress is taking another look at this. It's been many years since they had congressional hearings on UFOs. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. Uh, I uh, was not pleased by uh, the attacks on David Grush after uh, he gave his sworn statement uh, to the Congressional Committee. I am not pleased by the pushback that they're receiving from the Pentagon, but uh, the Pentagon has always given them pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the Pentagon has always been the agent behind the cover-up. So uh, that's nothing new. But I'm pleased to see it happening, and I hope that it continues to be funded. Oh, for sure. I, I, you know, I've, I watched some of it and I, I break it down into little parts where I watch a piece by piece by piece and I'll go back and I'll rewatch and listen to different things. And then, but you have to love those two guys in the back. You got George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell oh, just yes. sitting back there. It's like the, the two little guys that sit on your shoulder to, uh, you know, tell you a few little odds and ends. So what are you doing with yourself nowadays? I, I know you're, are you retired, not retired? Are you still pushing forward, looking into things, doing side jobs? What are you, what is <laughs> Kathleen Martin doing these days? Well, I'm building up steam. I had to be retired uh, due to long COVID, but I'm over it and I am getting back to work. I've just published a new book. Uh, I'm working on two additional books. If you go to my website at kathleen-martin.com, you uh, can look up the uh, Martin uh, Barton uh, survey on uh, religious belief and extraterrestrial life. We're closing that down at the end of the month. We're trying to get up to 700. Uh, we now have uh, 652. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you would uh, go there and fill that out for us, you do not have to be an experiencer. You don't have to ever have seen a UFO. You uh, can just be a member of the public and fill out the first 25 questions. 
if you've had your own experiences, you can go on and complete it, go to the end. And uh, we're going to be analyzing that data. We have a, uh, she has a doctorate. We have uh, another person with a doctorate who's interested in helping us with the statistical analysis. And then we are going to publish it into another book. <laughs> So that's and, uh, one of the two books that I'm going to be working on. Kathleen, that is so fantastic. I'm so glad that you're still diving deep into everything and doing what you're doing. I've been a fan, like I said, for a long time, and I'm just very thankful that you were able to do this and jump on. And sorry about the technical dif difficulties earlier, but we managed to pull through and redo this. And But every everything that you have link-wise, I will post in description as well for everybody who wants to click on the links, who wants to purchase books, wants to do anything and everything and reach out to you. I'll make sure that all that stuff is available with the description on this podcast so i like to say thank you once again sincerely for doing this and coming on and chit-chatting with me well thank you so much it was a pleasure to speak with you today